All right. Um, can you all take a seat? So I'd like to welcome. It does it work? I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to uh, today's event, and we're going to kick today's event off by um, the uh, awarding the Irja Jansson Award. So um, I'm going to ask um, Antti Suvanto from uh, the Irja Jansson Foundation to step forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the Uri Janssen Foundation is a private Finnish foundation established in 1954 by Hilma Janssen, the widow of uh, Professor Uri Janssen. Uri Janssen was a professor of economics at the Technical University of Helsinki in the early, 19, early 20th century. He passed, passed away all in, already in 1936 at the age of 59 years. The endowment donated by Hilma Janssen has grown in value over the decades. Today, the market value of the endowment is around 70 million euros. The Uri Janssen Foundation supports research in economics and medicine. The annual amount used to sponsor research varies between one and a half and two mil million euros. The, res the research grants are delivered are provided to support uh, research in economics and medicine. Internationally, the foundation is best known by the Uri Janssen Lectures and uh, the Uri Janssen Award in Economics, which is uh, delivered today. The Uri Janssen Lectures started back in 1963 and has thereafter organized 22 times, starting with Ken Kenneth Arrow. Other lecturers include well-known names and Nobel Prize winners such as Lawrence Klein, John Hicks, James Tobin, Robert Lucas, Amartya Sen, Bengt Holmström, Paul Krugman, Alvin Roth, and Peter Diamond. In fact, being invited to deliver the Uri Janssen lecture seems to be a good leading indicator of future Nobel Prize winners. Daron Asimoglu delivered the Uri Janssen lecture earlier this year in April. Uri Janssen Award in economics was established in 1993. A selection committee, the members uh, which are nominated jointly by the Executive Committee of the European Economic Association and the board of the Uri Janssen Foundation, selects award winners every second year. The size of the award is currently 20,000 euros. The award winner should have made a contribution in theoretical and applied research that is significant in, to economics in Europe. The first award in 1993 was shared by Jean-Jacques Lafon and Jean Tirot. This year, the Uri Janssen Award Selection Committee decided to award To, to award two distinguished London-based researchers who have done a lot of research jointly and separately in the field of applied economics. The winners are Professor Oriana Pantiera from London School of Economics and Imran Rasul from the University College London. Uh, Oriana uh, did his PhD in Boston College and Imran at London School of Economics. The work on the role of social relationships in economics advanced through pioneering field experiments in the workplace and social networks has provided salient contribution to economics, especially to the fields of personal economics, family economics, and development. The members of the award selection committee this year were Horatio Atanasio, Armin Falk, Eliana Laferrara, Cetil Sturesletten, and Hannu Vartiainen. Of them, 
Armin Falk has, is a previous award winner. Let me award thanks to the members of the award selection committee for the good work they have done, as, a, as always before. And also, I want to thank the members of the EEA Executive Committee for the good cooperation. Finally, let me warmly congratulate the winners. May I now invite Oriana and Imran to the stage and uh, Eli Dahl, Chief Executive of the Foundation, to award the prize to Oriana and Imran. So it is a great pleasure to follow up with the introduction of uh, Shetil's presidential address. Uh, Shetil Storzletten is a professor of macroeconomics at the University of Oslo. He obtained his PhD in Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon in 1995, and he's been a monetary uh, policy advisor at the Minneapolis Fed. Now he's a member of the executive board and the executive monetary policy committee of the Central Bank of Norway. Before joining the faculty in Oslo, Schiette was an associate professor at IIES in Stockholm. Uh, Shetil has been managing editor and chairman of the Review of Economic Studies for many years. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society of the EEA of CPR, and he's published extensively in the top journals of our profession. His research spans many important areas of macroeconomics and can be broadly grouped into four uh, categories. The first is quantitative macroeconomics. As early as 2000, he published a paper in JPE entitled Sustaining Fiscal Policy Through Immigration, which is nowadays extremely topical. So this paper studies the effect of immigration policy on fiscal sustainability in a context where the population is aging. So he uses a calibrated general equilibrium OLG model to account for differences between natives and immigrants and he shows that a more liberal immigration policy that allows the inflow of high and medium skilled immigrants of working age can bring about very high fiscal benefits. Another front of, on which Hietil's research uh, has been path breaking is the economics of China. Uh, his paper, Growing Like China, with uh, Zen Song and Fabrizio Zilibotti, is the best known in this line of work and uh, uh, has received prestigious recognition, including a prize from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. So in this paper, Shetil Snow shows that China's trade surplus is due to structural reasons, such as uh, privatization and the growth of firms that are uh, excluded from accessing local credit, and not so much to political reasons. In particular, uh, in their model, high productivity firms that cannot access credit markets have to finance their investment through uh, internal savings, while state-owned firms have access uh, to credit, uh, but uh, uh, low productivity. And eventually what happens is that high productivity firms outgrow low productivity ones if they save enough. And the downsizing of these financially integrated firms induces domestic savings to be invested abroad. Now, as I said, the paper has been very influential and as you can imagine, it's particularly topical given Donald Trump's stand on China and its policies these days. 
So uh, Shettle's third line of work covers political economy and welfare state dynamics, and uh, two notable papers here are The Survival of the Welfare State and Rotten Parents and Disciplined Children. And then finally, Shettle has written several important papers with Jonathan Heathcote and Gianluca Violante that include um, work on optimal tax progressivity, but I believe this is related to the topic of today's lecture, so I will not dwell on this. So after briefly talking about Shettle's research, I want to spend two words on the, his personality. And uh, one of his remarkable traits as a person is his optimism. So he always sees the bright side of things, and it seems then in, that in some cases this very optimism has put people's life at risk. Um, anonymous sources tell me about a time when Hetil was walking with a guest on the surface of Stockholm's frozen lake, and uh, the guest was a bit worried about the ice breaking, and he apparently said that the ice was so thick that horses could run on it. And uh, about two minutes later, the guest saw the ice cracking under his feet and fell into freezing water. <laughs> but, but I'm told that this person is still alive. <laughs> so, uh, Seriously speaking, those of you who know Shetil will agree with me that his energy and enthusiasm are quite unique. I've had uh, the honor of working side by side with him for the European Economic Association and the launch of the European job market, and his commitment has just been uh, invaluable. So I'm sure the same energy and enthusiasm will transpire from the presentation he's about to give, so I will stop and let you enjoy. Shetil's presidential address. So thank you very much for those kind words. It is true that um, um, we, I, it was not so difficult to get him up, and we ran home pretty fast because it was pretty cold, I admit. So uh, next time we were a bit more careful. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, taxation. So we. One of the biggest challenges facing um, uh, industrialized economies today is the rising inequality. Uh, the, um, rising inequality in, in income, health, wealth, etc. Um, this uh, is a phenomenon ha that's happening across um, industrialized economies, and but we've seen it most pronounced in Anglo-Saxon countries, in particular the United States. So if we, if we if you break down that inequality, so this graph sh shows um, inequality in male hourly uh, wages expressed as variance of log. So uh, you have time on the x-axis, and um, the red line is the, is the cross-sectional uh, inequality. You can see how it increases uh, from 0.3 to 0.45 by, by 2010, so an increase in 50%. That's pretty large. If you break that down into, into between group and within group inequality, the blue line is, is the inequality that's left, the inequality of the residual. If you imagine your control for, for uh, age education, um, the, the residual inequality, the variance of the, of the error term is the blue. So you can see that both the between group, which is essentially the, the right, reflects the rise in the college premium, uh, the between group have increased by about 0.05, and uh, uh, the, the within has increased by about 0.10. So, so it stems from both those sources. Now, how should the government respond to rising inequality? This is a, this is a, a topic um, uh, which is uh, uh, important. In fact, on the lunch session on Monday, um, the, um, a, a number of uh, um, uh, distinguished uh, economists presented them uh, their work on Deaton Review, which is aimed at uh, addressing this. Now, the natural first uh, instrument to use is the tax and redistribution policies. Sure, there are other uh, policies you could think of, for example, uh, education, training, labor market 
uh, regulation, to say minimum wage or active labor market policies, or, or competition policies, um, say uh, uh, affecting trade and migration. Um, but these are arguably less direct. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to know how we should design uh, the, the tax system in, in, in how the tax system should respond. I think we have to, we need, unfortunately, we need a macro model. We need a macro model because we, we need to, you cannot just say what, how should we respond if you don't have a theory for why the inequality increased. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, you also need to think of how, the, if you do those changes in the tax system, what would be the general equilibrium effects um, uh, transferring down to the economy, how it would affect um, the government budget, etc. Now, imagine we, uh, we take the view that yes, let's think about the, the tax and transfer system. Exactly how would we change it? Uh, should, should we increase progressivity? Well, the, uh, it's very tempting. Uh, in response to rising inequality to, to uh, increase progressivity. So for example, with higher progressivity, it's obviously you will be able to redistribute um, with respect to unequal initial conditions. So to the extent that, that, that uh, um, uh, young people are facing more and more unequal initial conditions, um, the more progressivity would, would, would address that. More progressivity would also, would also um, be a stand-in for missing markets. If, if, if people cannot insure against uh, some shocks, then, then the social insurance will, be, be, um, uh, will help people to uh, effectively insure against life cycle shocks. Now, higher progressivity has a cost side. It, uh, it distorts uh, labor supply. That's, that's the dimension where I guess most work or the work in public finance um, has focused on. But there is also a number of, of, of authors that, that think about how the, the tax system affects human capital investments. So it would be nice to, to, to try to capture both of these. And, and it would be nice to capture it in a model where, where uh, changes, the taxes are going to affect uh, GDP or total production. It's going to affect pre-tax income as well as um, uh, the distribution of pre-tax income as well as the, the distribution of consumption and labor supply. Now, uh, uh, we need to, to get started here. Um, I want to write down a macro model. So I could, of course, write down an incredibly complicated macro model where that we would just put the tax system as it is. That's hard to learn much from that. I'm going to do something much simpler. I'm going to um, propose a way to simplify it. Uh, once I've done that, I'm going to lay out a, a, a simple model and use that model to uh, to uh, quantify um, how, the, um, how taxes should respond to each component of the, so of, of the, of the rise in inequality. We're going to try to uh, decompose that. Um, and then in the end, we'll uh, try to think about how different additional policy instruments uh, would, would complement uh, these policies. I'm going to focus on the United States. And, and towards the end, I'll, I'll um, uh, try to, to connect to um, uh, Europe. All right. How can we measure the tax system in a really simple way? I tell you. Imagine, imagine you line people up uh, and um, uh, according to their pre-tax or pre-government income. So say just their income minus deductions, such as medical expenditures, et cetera. Um, and, and lump people in percentiles. And for each percentile, calculate the average. Take the log of that. So imagine now on the x-axis, we have log of pre-tax income for each percentile. And then, then we use using um, uh, microdata combined with um, a tax simulator, so tax sim. Um, uh, we calculate what is their after-tax earnings plus transfers. Okay, that gives an idea of the disposable income for each for each each household. And then uh, again, take calculate the average for that percentile and take the log of that. Let's see what that looks like for the United States. It looks linear. It looks so. So it suggests that the tax system in the U.S. is approximately log linear. 
Okay, note, it's not exactly. So there's, it's, uh, it's bumping around here a little. But, and, and note in particular that the top percent pay slightly higher uh, uh, tax, uh, uh, taxes than this log linear tax system would, would, would suggest. Uh, due to probably due to the alternative minimum tax, and also at the bottom percentile is is a bit off this log linear. But for the vast majority, uh, uh, the the tax system looks log linear. Good. Now, so so that means that if I if I approximate the tax system with with a if I uh, where I say I have log of uh, disposable income on the left hand side, it's equal to constant plus another constant times log of pre-tax income. That's that's a reasonable approximation of the current tax system. So it turns out, or I could do, write like this, disposable income is equal to lambda times uh, uh, income to the power of y minus tau, where tau captures, as you'll see, uh, a progressivity. And if I, just looking at that graph, suggests that tau is 0.18. All right, it turns out that there is actually a long tradition in public finance looking at exactly that tax system, starting with uh, Feldstein, uh, uh, Torsten Persson, Benabou, uh, and others have looked at that. The, the reason why people like that tax system so, so much is that it has a couple of nice properties. See, if we set tau equal to one, then you have complete redistribution. Everybody gets the same regardless of how much they earn. If tau is between zero and one, then the tax system is progressive. It's progressive in the sense that the marginal tax is always higher than the average tax for every income level. Okay? Um, conversely, if tau is negative, the tax system is regressive in the sense that marginal tax is lower than the average tax. And, and if tau is equal to zero, we just have the standard flat tax system uh, where marginal tax is equal to the average tax always. With this tax system, um, it, it's, um, there's going to be, a, uh, you should think of this as a tax and transfer system, it includes transfers. So there's going to be, there's going to be break even level of income where your, your, your pre-tax uh, uh, um, income is exactly equal to the post tax and transfer income. Uh, it, it, um, yes. I have to say that this is a good, this is a good approximation if we look, if we ignore uh, the people who are outside of the labor market. When I did that, when I did that, graph here, I included only people who had some attachment to the labor market. Uh, so I, I, but but that's, that, that's what I want to have. I want to have a theory of people. Uh, I want to think about uh, taxation of a, a, a particular labor income. Good. So if we do that, if we do that exercise, instead of the, for the US as a whole, federal, federal level, we could do it on a, on a, on a, on a local, on a state level. What you, do, what you find then, is so here the, the red means low progressivity and blue means high progressivity. Turns out that the Democrat leading states, leaning states tend to be, have more progressive taxes and Republican leaning states tend to have more, more uh, uh, lower tax progressivity. Uh, it, it could, um, if, if, that tax, if the tax system is exactly log linear, then it turns out that that tau has a very, can, can be expressed in a very simple way. Uh, tau would then be equal to the average marginal tax rate minus the average tax, over one minus the average tax. That's nice, because if we have measures of the average marginal tax rate and the average tax, and we combine those measures with, with this assumption, then we, can, then we could look at what tau looks like across countries, for example, or over time. So if we do that across countries, uh, we find that, um, well, uh, perhaps not surprising, Surprising, the U.S. has a pretty, not a very progressive tax system. Uh, Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden has a very t progressive tax system, whereas continental Europe is kind of in the middle. Uh, if you do that over time in the United States, this is a, a graph from, from uh, Freire and Navarro, uh, you see something cool. So tax progressivity was really low before the Second World War. During the Second World War, there was a massive increase in tax progressivity, uh, and that, uh, that tax progressivity uh, increased towards the early 80s. And then uh, during Ronald Reagan, uh, tax progressivity fell substantially and remained kind of flat thereafter. Note that between, say, 1980 uh, and today, there has been a decline in tax progressivity 
during the time when inequality increased. So now, how should, how should the tax system respond to that rising inequality? Uh, now, I'll try to develop a simple macro model to, to address that issue. So I want that model, I want that model to capture the, the, the pros and cons of progressivity. Okay, so I, I, I like to have, I like the model to feature uh, some partial insurance against labor income risk. So, so I want there to be some exposed risk. Some, some people are going to be hit by something when they're in the labor market. Uh, I want there to, to be um, as some ex ante heterogeneity. I'm going to model that as uh, differences in learning ability and differences in, 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 in diligence or preferences for, for work. All right. Um, I want there to be flexible labor supply so that there is some labor distortion that can, can some labor that can be distorted. And I want, I want there to be an endogenous choice of skills, some human capital accumulation. Why? Well, I want to be able to capture that as a potential distortion. And I want to, I want to be able to think about some general equilibrium effects. Um, if we, uh, so I want an equality to be endogenous, basically. And finally, I'm going to have some, uh, there will be some government consumption in the background over and above the tax system. At now, this seems a bit cryptic. Why do I put that? You'll see that, that quantitatively, that's going to matter quite a bit. Uh, I'm, I, I will, unfortunately, not do, uh, I'm not going to do a um, release analysis here. Instead, I'm going to do a standard, I'm going to do a standard Ramsey approach, where I'm going to take the market structure as given and take the tax instruments as given. I'm basically going to say, well, you saw that the tax system was log linear. How, if we can tweak it, how should we tweak it? Okay? So, so that's going to help us answering, should the tax system be more or less progressive? That's the, that's the aim uh, of, the, of the talk. So here's the model. <clears throat> It's a perpetual youth model, so some people die with, that people die with some constant probability, and, and, and there's every, every period there's a, a new set of people coming in. We, I need somebody to invest in human capital. Um, when people are born, um, they, um, they, the first thing they do is to choose skill. And they can choose S, uh, so individual I chooses SI. Good, but there is a disutility of doing that. I'm going to model that as a, as a so to, the education cost is a utility cost here. I model that as a, as a power function. Um, but, but, uh, but people are going to differ in the disutility of, of, um, of uh, skill choice. So you think of that as a learning ability. So that, that parameter kappa is a learning ability. So these kappas are going to differ across people. Good. Once a skill is choice, uh, chosen, people enter the economy and, and work, consume, um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and choose assets, etc. Um, then the utility, for the pure utility function is standard. So log, util, uh, they have, uh, log of consumption minus uh, uh, standard dish utility of labor supply. So this, this parameter sigma here, one over sigma would be the fish elasticity in a standard model. But you'll see. It's not going to be exactly that here. Um, the, 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 um, and then there's also utility of the public good that everybody has the same. The, the, the non-standard thing here is that there is a, there's a preference weight in front of the dish utility of labor supply. So people will differ in uh, respect to, with respect to how, 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 how much they feel like working or how the disutility of additional effort. Think of that as uh, capturing differences in diligence, or it could be differences in, for example, uh, it could be dis dis if somebody is disabled, it could be very painful to provide uh, a labor supply. That's going to be important for later. Good. Let's, let's just think about technology, and then we can, uh, uh, and then we can roll. So um, the there's going to be people who choose a bunch of different skills. Let, think of N of S as the total supply of skill S. Okay, we'll just add up the efficiency units of everyone who has exactly that skill. Okay, um, then, then total production is a, is a CES, constant elasticity of substitution, uh, aggregated over all those skills. Okay, that means that, that in, in, um, and the skill price is then just the marginal product 
uh, of your skill. That means that uh, there will be um, a brain surgeon in this model and a janitor. They're going to have a different wage. Not because a brain surgeon is particularly good or much better. It's just that there are few brain surgeons and many janitors. Why don't janitors become brain surgeons? Well, it's very painful. And therefore, uh, because they have a huge disutility of becoming brain surgeons, uh, therefore there are uh, be few of them. Good. Um, in addition, there is, uh, is uh, going to be no savings in this economy. So the aggregate resource constraint is just total output is equal to total consumption plus the public good. Let's talk about, let's talk about um, efficiency units. That's the last, or the last uh, building stone. And then we can really see what the model has to tell us. So th those, those efficiency units, um, the, the Z, so here is the, here's the, here's the total efficiency units. This is Z times uh, hours worked. So the efficiency units for an individual, log of that can be decomposed into two components, alpha and epsilon. Alpha is going to be a random walk, and there's going to be some innovations, omega. Those omegas are permanent. So, so those, those shocks, omega shocks are permanent. There will also be uh, the epsilon. Think of that as an IID process over time. It doesn't have to be, but to, to make the exposition simple, imagine this ID over time. Now, in this model, uh, earnings, so pre-government earnings, are going to be determined by the product of the price of your skill times your efficiency units times the hours you supply. Okay, so it's linear in hours. Good. So that means that that. Um, uh, so this is the skill price. This is efficiency. This is efficiency in hours. It means that earnings are determined by human capital uh, investment. Um, they're determined by luck. This uh, luck, and they're determined by effort. Good. Uh, let, let me just talk about the planner, and then we can really uh, start the analysis. So um, the, the government here it doesn't um, it cannot uh, issue debt. So so total government spending, total government uh, consumption is equal to net taxes. Uh, and um, um, so the government is going to choose uh, three, three things, G, the progressivity tau, and this, um, this the thing that captures the proportion of taxes, lambda. So the government chooses three things, but it has to respect the, bud the budget constraint. So you could, you could just as well determine, from this equation, we could determine one of them. Let's determine lambda. Let's let lambda be determined from this. So now the government chooses two things, g and tau. All right. Uh, let's, um, let's make two more assumptions. Let's assume that uh, I'm going to focus on steady state analysis here. Uh, so if, 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 um, if investments were reversible, then the transition to the new steady state would be immediate. Uh, uh, that makes my life simple. If, if I didn't, I could do the analysis with, with uh, where there is uh, skills are rever uh, irreversible. Um, there would be, then there would be a standard, um, uh, standard motive for having uh, high taxes initially, just that you want to capture the initial, you want to capture the sunk investment. So that's a little boring. So I'm not going to talk about that. So you could, if you like, you can think of this as a steady state analysis. Now, the planner, they, they, it's a little tricky because there are some people alive today and then there are people born in the future. So we have to think about how the planner cares about those. Turns out, uh, if you assume that the planner cares about future generations, discounts future generations at the sake, exactly the same rate at which people discount utility over their life cycle, then uh, the planner preferences are, are nice and time consistent. And, 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 and in that case, it's very simple because the planner just maximizes steady state utility. Good. Let's go with that and see what that has to give us. Uh, in that case, in equilibrium, it turns out that the choice of G is very simple. It's always conditional on the total uh, remember, remember, everybody have the same trade. Since, every, since the public good uh, is additive in the utility function, uh, everybody have the same trade-off between consumption and public goods. So there is no condition on a certain amount of government revenue. Everybody agrees uh, on how much to spend on public goods. 
So that's, that problem is very simple. Um, so that means that the, the, the only thing left to decide is tau. So, okay, let me just, uh, uh, I have to make one more comment about the market structure. So the, the, uh, there are idiosyncratic shocks here, epsilon and, and omega. The, I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna take a, do a standard assumption on omega. I'm gonna assume, like in an Ayagari model, that those shocks, there are no markets to ensure those shocks. You can, you can save in a bond, but you cannot ensure the realizations of omega. But you can ensure the realization of epsilon. There are a full set of continuing claims for doing that. Sounds a little, why do I need that for transitory shocks? Well, it turns out that uh, by, by doing that, the, the, the model becomes particularly simple to, to solve. And, and now the model, the, uh, this model captures a couple of special cases. So for example, if the, the, the variance of the transitor shock is positive and the variance of these this, uh, this permanent shocks are positive, then we're in a, we'd be in a partial insurance economy. In fact, in that case, we could call the omega shocks we can call them uninsurable because they, they will be completely uninsurable in equilibrium, as you'll see. And the, and the epsilon shock, you can, we can call them insurable shocks. Uh, if we shut down all heterogeneity and, 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 and assume that the old skills are perfect substitute, we would be in a representative agent economy. It sounds a little boring, but, but that will be useful uh, in a moment. Good, let's, let's think about how in equilibrium, given a particular tax system, what would people choose? Turns out in this model, um, um, we have to think about the skill prices or the, the equilibrium in the, in the skill market uh, for, for skill prices, and we have to think about the choices of consumption and hours worked. <clears throat> so it's a hard problem because the, when thinking about what to, skills to choose, people want to look, see the, the price of skills. But in order to calculate the price of skills, you have to know the distribution of pe that people choose. So it turns out here that that problem is, is very simple. If we guess that Jacob Minzer was right. So if we guess that the uh, skill, log of skill price is exactly linear in skills, like people do when they write down the standard Minzer regression, um, then in that case, uh, the choice of skill will be, turns out to be exactly linear in, in your learning ability. Uh, and uh, it's linear in learning ability, but, but uh, it's distorted by the choice of tax progressivity. So higher tax progressivity is gonna mean that you choose less skill. So, so uh, the brain surgeon, when you, the one who used to choose to be a brain surgeon, once you crank up progressivity, perhaps that person will become a technician instead. Or, or nurse. Um, uh, the, 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 this psi here from the utility function, that's gonna be the elasticity of that choice. Uh, it turns out that, that we can calculate the return to, or the skill premium here, or the return to skill, this pi one in this equation up here. Um, if you look at that, it depends on, on, on theta, which is the complementarity between skills. It depends on, on psi, which is how elastic the skill choice is, and it depends on progressivity. In a bit of a surprising way, see, it turns out that when you increase progressivity, that increases the skill premium. Why is that? Well, it's, if you think about this brain surgeon now, uh, when you increase progressivity, some of those brain surgeons, will, will, there will be fewer brain surgeons. That's gonna mean, of course, that the return to that skill is gonna increase. So that's gonna, that, that Stiglitz effect is somehow going to work against a planner who is trying to redistribute against, um, uh, by, uh, against um, uh, these uh, learning abilities by cranking up <coughs> uh, progressivity. Good, let's talk about consumption and labor supply. And then we, then we will be ready to, to, do the, uh, to do the analysis. So it turns out that uh, in, in, uh, in this model, consumption, log of consumption is log linear in, uh, in these latent factors. Um, so so 
uh, it turns out that obviously if you, uh, if you have a uh, larger weight, if you have a larger dish utility work, larger phi, or if you have a larger alpha, this uninsurable uh, component or wages, or if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a larger uh, phi, you're going to consume less. If you have a larger alpha, you will consume more. If you have a higher price of the skill, you will also consume more. But those things are being modified. The pass-through of that heterogeneity is reduced when tau is increased. That's, ex that's good. That's exactly what we wanted the, the progressive tax system to do. Similarly, uh, labor supply uh, uh, will depend negatively on, on the dish utility labor supply, and it's going to depend positively on the, on the, on the insurable shock on, on epsilon. But it's not going to be modified by, by the fish elasticity. It's going to be, there's, uh, it's going to be multiplied by uh, something smaller than the fish elasticity. So it's like tax progressivity reduces the effective uh, 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 fish elasticity in this model. Good. Let's think about, let's now, um, the first thing I'll do, uh, I'll think about what the um, level of, of progressivity should be in this model. And then we'll think about changes. Let's, the first thing I'll do, I, let's shut down all progressivity. Uh, sorry, all heterogeneity. Just think of the representative agent economy. And then I, I, I plot the, utility, uh, the, the social welfare function, uh, that's the blue line, uh, for, for, uh, uh, against different pro rates of progressivity. So before we look at that particular number, let's just think a bit what, uh, what the representative agent case gives you. Well, uh, we know in, when there's a representative agent, it's very simple. Uh, we know uh, uh, how that one way to implement the first best is just to have a lump sum tax equal to uh, as much public goods that you like to provide, and then let people do whatever they like, except for that. So that means that at the optimum, the marginal tax rate in, of income is going to be zero, and the average tax rate is going to be positive. That means that the taxes, tax system is, pro, is regressive at the optimum, at the first best. Right, so if you give now, give the planner and say, look, you don't have lump sum taxes. You have to use this log linear tax system. The planner is going to say, Oof, shoot. Uh, well, fortunately, I can implement the first best. But that's going to mean that taxes will have to be regressive. So that's why that's what you can see here uh, uh, in, in this model. The, 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 you get a large negative uh, uh, progressivity for the representative agent. Assuming that the, you want the government to the, the, you want the, uh, you want the government to fund something over and above the redistribution. If you, have, if you had no redistribution, then obviously in the representative agent uh, case, tau would be zero. But uh, but uh, we we see that, for example, in the United States, um, the government consumption is roughly 20% of GDP. So uh, in this model. Uh, that would correspond to having that level of tax progressivity. So that, that's going to be a force, kind of right-wing force for aggressivity that will always be with us. All right, let's now think about, uh, let's now think about skill, uh, uh, skill heterogeneity. Uh, in this model, uh, the dispersion of um, uh, skill prices, uh, it turns out to be in equilibrium, one over theta squared. Uh, so I know, remember, uh, we saw that in 2010, the between group inequality, law, variance of log between group stuff was 0.1. Well, that in order for this model to be consistent with that, we have to, have to be that, the, that, that uh, uh, complementarity between skills is about three. Um, then then we, could, the, um, we have to tell you how to, uh, um, the, the, this skill investment price elasticity. Uh, that um, we, could, we could set that so as to be consistent with the way um, um, return to skill, um, skill inequality, and tax progressivity have changed over the years. Good. So when I do that, when I, imp when I, when I put that, obviously the plan, the social welfare function of the planner increases a lot. Uh, and also, the, 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 the maximum of this, so the, the optimal choice in this case, becomes you, you undo almost all of that regressivity. You undo by, by uh, introducing skill uh, heterogeneity. Because the plan would like to redistribute across people with different um, um, uh, learning abilities. Good. Let's now think about, um, let's now think about um, 
preference heterogeneity. So it's not so obvious that you, you want to redistribute across different levels of preference heterogeneity. You think, for example, the, the work that um, uh, Klaus Kreiner and his, um, and his co authors in, in Copenhagen do on that. Uh, it looks like people have very different attitudes towards redistribution uh, against um, um, uh, things that are related to choice, for example, how many hours you work relative to luck. Anyway, um, um, so, so, so it, would be very, it would be important to know how large the dispersion in phi is. How can we know? Well, remember, if I write, let me, let me write down to you again the allocations of, of hours and consumption. So, so phi here is something, captures something that moves hours that's unrelated to wages. Okay, if you ask the runner of the mill macroeconomists, they say they would typically think, oh, perhaps heterogeneity uh, is, uh, perhaps uh, wages account, could be that wages account for mo most of the variation in, in, in hours. That could be. But, but Im imagine, imag in this model at least, um, uh, we allow for these two factors, the, the preference heterogeneity and something about wages to affect hours worked. If we look at consumption, um, um, uh, uh, consumption, um, this, um, this disutility of work is going to enter there in the same way. Why? Well, if you work fewer hours. If you have five, you work fewer hours and you consume less. That's a permanent thing. So, so, so but the, the transitory shocks, they don't enter into consumption. And the permanent uninsurable stuff, they don't enter into hours. So by taking the covariance, between consumption and hours, we can get an idea of how important those preference heterogeneity is. It turns out that the covariance between consumption and hours is very large. So re remember, if suppose all heterogeneity in, in wage, hours worked were driven by wages, and imagine the income effects would, were strong, then that covariance could be negative. Turns out it's positive, uh, and that gives us an idea of how large that preference heterogeneity has to be. Okay? And it's about twice as important for accounting for hours worked as wages are. If you plug that back into the model, uh, obviously, when you have more heterogeneity, um, um, that's going to lower a bit the utility of the planner. Um, so that's why the, the purple line here is, is below. But, and it, it increases the desired progressivity, but not a lot. All right. Um, uninsurable risk, obviously. Uh, if if um, a large uninsurable risk, that's going to be something intuitively that would, would uh, be a, a force in, for, uh, uh, to increase the, the progressivity. But how do we know how large it is? Well, um, Blondell and Preston had a very good idea of how to do that. Let me see. Oops. Uh, namely, by looking at Namely by, if I do this. Namely by looking at um, the dispersion consumption. So in this, this model, I can, the, the variance of consumption is equal to uh, uh, the, the, the heterogeneity, uh, the, this, these sources of heterogeneity in, 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 in uninsurable or permanent heterogeneity in wages multiplied by the, this one minus the, the, the progressivity squared. So, so I, I just take the variance, just take the variance of, of this stuff. So, so that means that we can, if I know, if I have an idea of how important preference saturation is and how important the uh, skill price dispersion is, then I, can just, then I can immediately figure out how large the variance of alpha is. And if I do that, Using the um, uh, uh, US data, I would find, uh, uh, think that the variance of alpha is about 0.1. Okay, I feed that in. That's going to lower the utility of the planner or the social welfare, welfare substantially and increase, give a substantial increase in the, in the desired uh, uh, redistribution. If I, uh, the last component is the uninsurable risk. So, sorry, the insurable risk. Now, how can I identify that? Well, I could, I, I could identify that residually. I know how large the, 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 the within-group inequality is. Uh, 
and uh, I know how large the uninsurable part of that is, where the rest by construction has to be insurable. That gives me an idea about the variance of epsilon. I plug that back into the model and ask, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, the, the majority of the, the within group uh, inequality is insurable according to this calculation. That the reason is that the variance of um, wages or the variance of, of earnings is much higher than the variance of consumption. So, so the, the, that difference has to be, by construction, has to be insurable. Good. That, the, the red line here, obviously, it's, it's good for the planner to have insurable risk. Uh, uh, it, it also reduces, as we expe expected, it reduces a bit the desired, um, uh, the, the desired uh, progressivity, but not by a, a large amount. Good. So according to this model, this simple model, the optimal progressivity is about 0.08, which is lower than the progressivity we measured for the U.S. Uh, in, in 2010, 0.18. So, and this, the reason I show you show this is is to uh, emphasize the the mechanism. Uh, there are some 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 obvious uh, um, things uh, we could do to, that would affect that would affect um, uh, the the in this model the, the desired um, progressivity. For example, suppose instead suppose we think that the um, all the permanent heterogeneity across people is uninsurable. That it's, it's, there's nothing. This uh, skill choice doesn't uh, account for anything. Well, in that case, there will be the, the desired progressivity will be substantially higher. Uh, if you think that uh, that you, if, if you could, if you didn't have to finance this additional stuff of um, uh, the government consumption. You also the desired progressivity would also be substantially higher and higher than what it is today, uh, or perhaps I mean in the, I, in order to solve the model, uh, I assume a very low risk aversion. One, imagine the planner had some slightly higher some inequality aversion. Well, then, then it's that, that would obviously uh, affect the um, uh, uh, the desired progressivity. So now I, I, I started out promising I wanted to try to give an answer to how, how the tax system should respond to the rising inequality. So here is how I want to do that experiment. So I go back to 1980, and remember, uh, we saw that um, then the progressivity, tax progressivity, the progressivity of the tax and transfer system was much higher than it is today. In fact, uh, it was about point 20, tau was about 0.21 in 1980. All right. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to I'm going to set the inequality version. Um, think of an, an Benabou style inequality version, so that uh, the tax progressivity in 1980 was exactly right. So what is needed to do that is to have um, a, a tax, uh, an uh, inequality version of 2.8, which means approximately. It's as if. Uh, approximately as if the planner had a risk aversion of three when I look at the consumption of people. So not very, it's not very left wing. I think that's very reasonable. I think that's a very reasonable number. Good. Then I'm going to think about each of those drivers of inequality and ask how each of them, uh, uh, how the, the, the taxes should, how, how, how Tao should have responded to each of those changes. Okay, and those three changes are going to be um, uh, skill based technical change. It's going to be an increase in the uninsurable risk and increase in the insurable risk. Okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, think about a change in preference saturnity. Uh, one reason is that if I if I calculate if I if I estimate the amount of preference saturnity the way I did, then there is no change. Good. So. Um, so the, for them, um, for them, skill based technical. The, there is a, the, the way skill based technical change happens in this model is through changes in theta. So changes in the degree of complementarity across skills. So uh, I, I, we saw that the amount of uh, between group inequality, or the, 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 the dispersion in variance of log wages that's due to the skill premium, uh, college premium, uh, increased by about. 
0.25. So uh, if, if, uh, if um, uh, theta in 2010 was about 3, it must mean that in 1980 it was about uh, four and a half. Okay, so let's just do that. Let's think of think of that change, letting theta go from four and a half to um, to th uh, three. What what will happen then is that the, the Pareto tail, the, the tail of the wage distribution, will, will become substantially heavier, roughly in line, by the way, with uh, with what we observed. It turns out then that uh, the optimal progressivity should increase. Uh, it go, should go from 0.21 to 0.23. So. Uh, uh, perhaps not a very large increase, but at least an increase. Why? Well, because the planner, as we saw, the planner has this desire to redistribute across uh, in, in, in initial uh, uh, learning abilities. Good. Let's think about now, uh, now about the increase in uninsurable risk. How can we, obviously, the answer uh, of how pro progressive tax should be will depend critically on how much the variance of uninsurable risk increased. Again, I consult uh, uh, Blundell and Preston, uh, uh, and, and, and they say, well, you, you should make sure the model captures exactly the, ri the rise in consumption inequality. So if we do that, uh, it, that suggests that, uh, that, the, uh, that the variance of uninsurable risk increased by about 0.028. That means that 28% of the increase in, uh, in, in, in residual wage inequality was uninsurable. So it could be that you think that that's low. Well, uh, um, if you think that it should be higher than that, it would have to be that you think for some reason the consumption inequality is actually much higher than the rise in consumption inequality is actually much higher than what CEX suggests. And that could be. That could be. If you look at the work uh, uh, um, of um, um, uh, Rocio and Coulters, uh, they've been emphasizing the, the, the declining quality of the CX over time. But anyway, I'm going to take the, the data at face value. <clears throat> now I find that the optimal tax progressivity should increase quite substantially by, by uh, 0.033. So note that, that the, the, the rise in, in uninsurable permanent inequality is about uh, is only half of the stuff that came from the skill premium. But the, but the response in, in, in progressivity is much higher. Why is that? Well, to, for the uninsurable uh, risk, there is no holding back. It can only be good to, uh, to, to reduce, to increase progressivity in response to that. But to the, but for, 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 for the skill accumulation. On the one hand, you distort uh, skills down. On the other hand, the skill premium increases. So that makes it less desirable to, uh, to, uh, to increase progressivity in response to, um, uh, in response to, uh, to um, um, in, in, uh, skill by technical change. OK, uh, the last one is uninsurable risk. Again, uh, insurable risk, sorry, the increase in the variance of epsilon. Again, we did do that uh, residually. Remember that the, the, the between group, the residual inequality, increased by about 0.1. We said that 0.028 was insurable. That means that 72% of that increase was insurable. Plug that back into the model, and that suggests that, suggests that progressivity should fall by about 0.01. Let, let me now put things together. Uh, so in that case, the optimal progressivity should increase uh, to uh, to uh, 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 about point oh, uh, to uh, from point twenty one to point twenty almost point twenty five. So what would have been the consequence of doing that? Well, uh, in the model, uh, it means that uh, if we had instead of having a, uh, the current progressivity of point eighteen, we had chosen a progressivity of point uh, point twenty five. Uh, the consumption inequality would be substantially lower. <clears throat> it would have been uh, lowered by 15%. But, but obviously, uh, it would, there would be a cost in terms of lower GDP or lower uh, aggregate consumption. Consu aggregate consumption should fall then about, by about 4.4%. So that trade-off would be optimal if you have a, a risk aversion of three. So that's why, that's why that, that's, that's where the, the planners, see, that's where the, 
um, the planners inequal diversion for round three uh, uh, stems from. So is that, is that uh, as I said, I don't think that's a particularly high value. And, and by the way, I think that, I think that uh, when, when people evaluate, when, peop when people are asked, when we think, should we redistribute? Obviously, uh, a case for redistribution is that, yes, the poor, they have a high margin utility of an extra pound. But we also have uh, an intrinsic, we care intrinsically for them. So that the latter would, be, uh, uh, would mean that we would, we would, um, we would actually have some, some positive uh, inequality version. So I, 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 don't think, I don't think this is a big, uh, I don't think that's a big number. I think that's a reasonable one. Now, so the optimal should increase with, uh, given, if you have the preferences from 1980, you should increase progressivity, but the, it, it ended up going down. How can you understand that? It could, of course, be that the model is crap. But, but if one interpretation is that, uh, is that the, the inequality version in society actually fell. And there is some evidence of that. Um, uh, 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 namely, from the world, uh, uh, data that uh, Tim Beslev um, uh, uh, analyzed from the World Value Survey suggests that the courts born after 1970 have uh, uh, prefer less redistribution than those born before. So that's at least uh, 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 consistent with, with our findings. You could, of course, um, use other instruments. So for example, um, here I had a very simple tax system. We have the same taxes for everyone. What if we could let the tax system vary over the life cycle? That's a possibility. It turns out if you do that, you calculate the tax progressive for, for each age group in the United States, there is, there is no age variation, very little. So that's not the dimension the, U, the United States is exploiting. But imagine you could do it. How would you, what would you do then? Well, it turns out uh, that you would want the progressivity to be U-shaped over the life cycle. Why? Well, there are basically two forces here. One force is that because uh, this permanent inequality is building up over the life cycle, that's, a, that's an argument for having progressivity increase with age. Um, on the other hand, um, the, um, the life cycle profile of earnings and the, uh, is hump-shaped, and the age profile of hours worked is kind of flat. Those would be arguments in favor of having a kind of a U-shaped or having a, 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 um, a progressivity that's falling with age, at least when you're young, and rising later. So putting those two together implies that you will have this, this, this U-shape. Um, you could, it, it, in a, in a if you take a, do you take a Merlis perspective, um, the taxes, taxes should generally depend on, on, on whole history of earnings. It's a hard problem to, to analyze. Um, uh, Mark Kapiska has shown that if you, inst if you, inst if you it, that system simplifies a lot. If you, if you assume the planner, that the planner can have, can tax all the his whole history of income, but it has to be kind of this log linear system for each, um, for each um, uh, year. Um, now, obviously, uh, it's one thing I've emphasized in this talk is that optimal taxation depends, uh, interacts with skill choice. Uh, and um, th th that's, that's something a number of authors have, have, have addressed, Stancheva uh, and others. Now, in thinking of, of additional instruments, education subsidies and training come to mind. Now, suppose. You, a point that uh, Krug and Ludwig and Finlayson and Sachs make is that suppose you, suppose you really want to have a lot very progressive taxes. Um, you worry about that, um, the distortion to, to, uh, to education. But you can, if you could, if you could, so if you could have education subsidies in combination with high uh, progressive taxes, then you could kind of, then you could, then you could mitigate the distortion on um, uh, on um, uh, edu education choice. So the, the, you, you typically see, uh, the, these authors argue, that you see precisely that in, in countries with very, quite progressive taxes. That's exactly where you see the most education subsidies. Um, you could, and another issue that I think is, is um, uh, very important uh, is the issue of individual versus joint taxation. So some countries have uh, a joint taxation. Of, of couples, uh, United States, Germany, etc. But others have uh, separate 
uh, tax system. Scandinavia, I believe, also Canada has. So that joint taxation is a huge, uh, as huge a negative distortion on, uh, on, on labor force participation for the secondary earner. So that means that if you, so uh, Gunnar and, and Colters argue that if you move to separate taxation, that can have a very large positive uh, effects on, on female employment. And, uh, and uh, in, in a, a series of papers, uh, Bick uh, and Fuchsjöndal, Chakoborte uh, and Colters and others uh, argue that in fact, if you try to understand if you look, you look at you look at uh, United States versus continental uh, Europe, uh, uh, it's easy, perhaps, to explain why Europe has lower employment or they have higher taxes. But then it's a little difficult to understand why Scandinavia has much higher taxes, but still the same or higher employment rates than uh, uh, the United States. Well, this this also tells you that it is precisely this d distinction between separate versus uh, uh, versus joint taxation. So the message is. If you want to have high taxes, you have to do it in an efficient way. Uh, good. How much time do I have? Am I out of time? OK. Um, uh, so this, uh, it's, um, one could also think of other uh, uh, dimensions uh, to, uh, want to a number of people have, have intuited um, um, this issue of progressive taxation in, in analysis of, say, trade reforms. There's a sequence of papers uh, that think about uh, uh, the t uh, progressive taxation in the context of stabilization policies. For example, uh, uh, some work by Mc, uh, McCann and Reich argue that you could, in principle, use, it's in principle useful to use tax progressivity as a stabilization policy, but uh, it turns out that there are other, there are other policies that are more effective for, for, for achieving, achieving um, um, macroeconomic stability. Good, what should we work on next? I think it's really important to understand how tax policies have affected inequality, not only of pre-tax income, but also of endogenous uh, stuff like wealth, consumption, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Kajmark and Poshke and, and, and Hubmer and co-authors, they argue that you say, if you look at wealth inequality over time in the United States, the changes in the tax system is, is the most important driver of that. Um, uh, one can also, I think it's also important to study tax and redistribution interaction with these other uh, uh, instruments that we discussed in the beginning. And finally, I'm going to end by saying, I think we need more work on understanding exactly why did inequality increase in the first place. I think we, we have, there are standard stories out there, increased trade, uh, uh, technology, uh, etc. cetera. But, but for those stories to be believable, it has to be, I think, that those stories uh, those theories must be applicable to explain not only why uh, inequality increased in the United States and, and the UK, but also why the inequality, rise, change in inequality has been so small in countries such as Scandinavia uh, and, and Japan. Um, I think when uh, perhaps we have to think broader, uh, norms, institutions, I don't know. I'm done. Thank you, Chetil, that was great. Um, I wanted to ask you, what makes you confident that what you call um, preference heterogeneity is not driven by factors that might correlate with income or parental income and potentially be, can be affected by government as well? So uh, a good question. Okay. Well, when I think about it, I, let me I try to answer that. So that's a good question. Uh, I think, um, and it's very natural, the one thing that's very natural to think of is perhaps there is, um, uh, perhaps people have some wealth. Um, so that 
wealth should in influence um, uh, labor supply. It's not here. But to the extent that, that income effects are large in labor supply, that would, if anything, work in the, other, in the wrong direction. Um, um, if we could, I, I think the view certainly labor economics is that, uh, uh, is that wages affect labor supply, but it's only a, a small proportion of it. I, I, th I, I, I agree with you that um, uh, we need to think of, of how policy can affect other aspects of labor supply, but um, I think that's a good question to work on, but I haven't done. So, so, so um, Ramon wants to ask a question. <laughs> as you know, a lot of people are focusing now. You can use the mic. As you very well know, a lot of people are focusing now on the top, top, top of the uh, mm. income inequality. Yeah. What do you have to say on that? OK. So um, um, to the extent that the top uh, wealth inequality is driven by, for example, um, uh, monopoly rents, I have nothing to say. But to the extent that it's driven by uh, human capital accumulation, I have something to say. So if you think of the standard um, release exercise or uh, diamond side, they ask, imagine we don't care about the people in the tail. Uh, and we take their wages as uh, wage rates as exogenous. What would be the optimal? What would be the top of the left curve, basically, in terms of taxing them? So, in, in my model, that's the, r r the wrong approach because the moment you start to tax, you're going to distort their choices. So, in, in my model, the, the, the tail is endogenous. That's why my model would typically say that it's, it's optimal to tax them, them, them less. That's also, by the way, uh, uh, a point that's made by Huggett and Coulters. Um, so I don't think 80% is the right number. <laughs> Thanks. Eh? Okay. Great. Good.